to talk about today is my project, which is called VRAS, which is just an acronym. It means using virtual reality and archaeoacoustic analysis to study and exhibit presence. There are a lot more words in there than there were acronyms, but those are all lowercase, so don't worry about it. Um, so, and then after that, I'm going to talk about the goals, like my pro personal project goals, um, and also what I hope to achieve through my two years here. Um, I'd like to talk for a minute about how I view the ambient landscape and you know, how I also view it in relationship to things like cultural heritage and the soundscape. I also want to talk after that about some ways that I view the role of the ambient in focusing attention and listening. And then I will talk about some, give an example of a piece of field work that I've done so far as a practice. And I will talk briefly about the piece that I made using the technologies that I've worked on. And it's very handy. So, me, who am I? Other than what I just said. Um, I, my primary training has been in experimental music, um, in electronic music and interactive art. Um, I've done a lot of, sometimes I've worked in spectral music. Um, <clears throat> I also play the viola de gamba, and so I've always been very interested in historical performance, where I've been studying how people have heard the world and basic ways in which people have notated things and the ways in which this has changed. Um, it's actually, it's hard to, uh, to study how people heard things, but hopefully through practices research we can get that. Um, so first I'd like to talk about my personal approach to ambient listening or ambient space. We've touched on a lot of other things yesterday that were very important, but I think Apart from me is, the ambient for me is a, I approach it from a purpose of deep listening from, you know, where the ambient is a focuser of attention and awareness. I also view listening as a representation of the present moment. And through my own practice, I've come up with some sonic meditations that based on things like, like, listening to space, like trying to walk around the space without your ears, I mean, without your eyes, not your ears, you need them. Um, things like echolocation, where you just, you try to understand how people hear. And um, my, one of my favorite anecdotes came from Barry Blesser's book, Spaces Speak, Are You Listening?, where he talks about um, that Ray Charles used to ride his bike. And, and he could do that. And I was like, he can do that. Maybe I can do that. And so I would walk around space and um, practice trying to walk without being able to hear as I was approaching barriers or being able to hear sounds as they walk, as I walked past them, and trying to hear my own footsteps as I could hear them against the walls or trees or grass. And, and so I made a practice out of that. And, that was one of my, I did that sonic meditation as part of one of my deep listening workshops and, um, and presented it there and had everyone try it and everyone had a great time. Um, I also imagine the ambient as a form of attunement and where then that kind of attention goes in line with attention and awareness where you use sound just like in the music of the spheres to analyze and understand the invisible. Um, basically, making the inaudible audible, making things that don't speak, speak, or paying attention to things that are subtle. <coughs> basically, for me, the ambient and the music is whatever happens to be there and 
at least in this case, my work will come from, my exploration and attention to. <clears throat> oh, that's really okay, so about my project. As I mentioned, the RAS project stands for Using Virtual Reality and Archacoustic Analysis to Study and Exhibit Presence. Um, it's a two year project that began in October, and so it's still quite new to me, but I'm very enthusiastic. Um, some similar and inspiring projects in the archaeological domain would be the Archaeoacoustic Project by Tommaso Mattioli and Margarita Diaz Andrew, um, Miriam Collar's work at Stanford on uh, the soundscape in, um, in ancient, like, I don't remember. I'm going to mention it in a minute, so I'll get over that. And of course, Rupert's EMAC Project, which is the European Music Archaeological Project. Now, what are the goals of my project? Why did I want to do this? <laughs> um, so, one of the things is in the acronym is to explore and exhibit sound presence. And I'll go over what I mean when I say sound presence in a minute. But, but I'm looking for ways to present the kinds of things I'm interested in, which is an attention to space, an attention to just the aesthetic effects of place and possible exhibition and present public dissemination uses of this. Um, <clears throat> I want to create installations, works that will aid in the public dissemination and exhibition of these concepts. I would like to make tools and share them so that other people can work to express what it is that they hear. And and I would like, to, and I'm going to do some field work where, and I will work to document and exhibit what I find. So, now I'm going to talk about some examples of sound presence and what I mean. Um, so for example, a sound presence could be a very strong sense of place, like something that just has a a bizarre feature to it, or it just makes you interested in being there, or it makes you feel in some way that this place is special. This is very personal. Um, so at least in the field work, I'll be working on it from my perspective with the hopes of creating AR or game examples of this where then I can share my experience and possibly give people the ability to look and explore on their own and share it with me. Um, another one is places that tend to have a very strong sense of place tend to have strange acoustic patterns. Um, some of the ones that I've found when, like looking around, what people find interesting are places that obscure where sound is coming from. For example, places where the echo is louder than the place itself where what you said didn't come back and instead it came back from behind you in the other way and it's somehow inscrutable to your experience. Um, tends to be, as Rupert said, tends to be a lot of places that have interesting reverb. Everyone likes reverb. I like reverb. So. Um, another one would be the echo, <coughs> where the echo is a can be heard as a representation of the acoustics of a place. It can also be heard as the voice of a place, or it can be heard as a response. Like, and so I, I found, and this research has been done in, for example, studies on rock art, where people have been looking at, as it says, as Tommaso says, many societies give special importance to places where echoes are generated, and often these places receive special treatment, including the produ production of rock paintings in them. And I think that's very interesting. I like echoes, and I've walked around spaces where sounds have come back in strange ways and been very fascinated, and, and I would like to represent that in some way in VR and AR, so that people can, even if they're not there, they can explore it or maybe preserve it in some way. 
Um, another one seems to be, as I've studied around, is warbling sounds, like places that through either drone or some other way make sounds that kind of glow, that either obscure their um, dimension or seem to take on another dimension. And in terms of things like, as I would call them like, isoluminant sounds, like sounds where the where what they are and where they're coming from is obscured. And sometimes this can be done through physical manifestations of sounds such as um, beat frequencies and things like chorusing, things that seem to, even though you know, for example, what they're doing, you it doesn't sound like what you think should happen, which is an expectation thing, but it's also an acoustic thing. It's you know, it's a it's a manifestation of the physical space. And um, <clears throat> this was the, the ancient Shavin, that's what Miriam Kola was working on in Peru. I didn't want to get it wrong. So now you know. Um, so how does the how do I view the ambient landscape in cultural heritage? Is as we saw yesterday, is there's a, a theme in the ambient on the temporal, which is a sense of time, or a sense of place, or a sense of a past place, or a future place, or as you know said, places he's never possibly been. Um, in terms of archaeological or cultural heritage dissemination, that's in a way both a bug and a feature as I view it is it's a bug because in some sense when making ambient work or something representing space you have a, a bit of a responsibility not to manipulate people but at least that's how I view it. Um, you could give people the sense of a sense of pastness through your work but and maybe that's appropriate I'm going to reserve judgment on that. I'm going to try it out and see what happens. Um, it's also a feature because that resource is there, and with um, and with with these kinds of codes, you could code that you are someplace in the past, or that you can use either you can frame the space. <clears throat> now I bring up the much quoted in this conference, the, um, the Eno quote that says, the idea of making music in some way related to a sense of place, landscape, and environment, each place within its own particular landscape, and allowing the mood of that landscape to determine the kinds of activity that could occur. And um, I read that with a kind of, it's almost sounds like an archeology span to me, the idea of activities being chosen for places and the moods of those places giving some sort of evidence to the activity that occurred there. And I'm not really going to make any claims on that, but it does hint at the role of, you know, anthropomorphism, as we said yesterday, teleological thinking, and a fluidity of attention, which ambient, as we all know, is a form of attack in some cases. And so, how I would view using ambient sound in a VR and AR space is as a focuser of attention to space and to place. And so I view ambient, at least there's many definitions of ambient, but in one case ambient is just the noise that goes around because there's no such thing as silence. Like I can hear that speaker right there and it's making a little buzzing noise. And if I wanted to avoid that speaker, I would listen for that buzzing noise as it got closer to me. But then, um, I've, and in some cases, this can be kind of a form of stochastic resonance, which has been seen to show that your sense of hearing and your sense of your ability to sense space can be enhanced by the use of, you know, a little bit of noise or a little bit of a, some sounds other than silence. Silence is no good, and your footsteps and your echo can help, but it will be enhanced by the presence of maybe a rustling of trees or maybe a little white noise. Um, in this case, ambient sound is an augmenter of the present moment, an augmenter of 
your more subtle aspects of reality and possibly a way to practice. And um, I also view like ambient sound as a way of seeing with your ears. And as an example of this, I bring up what seems to be one of my favorite books is the <clears throat> Spaces Speak, Are You Listening? which was a very inspirational book for me because it made me go walk around with my eyes closed and, and I spent a lot of time just listening after that. And so I bring up this quote and it says, as a simple illustration of how we hear an object that itself does not produce any sound, consider a flat wall located at some distance. When the sound wave from a hand clap is reflected from the distant wall, we hear the reflection as an echo. Distance, distance to the wall determines the delay for the arrival of the echo. The area of the wall determines the intensity, and the material of the wall's surface determines the frequency content. These physical effects are related only indirectly to perception. Our auditory context, co cortex, converts these physical attributes into perceptual cues, which we can then use to synthesize an experience of the external world. And he goes in to say the wall becomes audible, or rather the wall has an audible manifestation, even though it is not itself the original source of sound energy. When our ability to decode spatial attributes is sufficiently developed using a wide range of acoustic cues, we can readily visualize objects and spatial geometry. We can see with our ears. And I found that really great. And, and I think that that really summarizes a goal in the in my views on like AR spaces and my views on making game spaces where the purpose of these, it's not really a game, it's more of a practice. And um, <clears throat> one of the things that I've noticed when writing in this is the role of the physical attention because in a virtual space or a walking space is the attention, the way that you go to hear is different than if you are a composer where you are kind of in kind of the director's chair where you get to decide where everything is and what's going. A lot of times this is very dealing with, you know, indeterminacy. There's a lot of opportunity for going the wrong way. Every sound you hear is in with, you can obviously record sessions from game audio and things, but the sounds are never the same where you heard and where you focused your ears or where you focused your virtual ears are never going to repeat themselves. And so a lot of times you have to, you're always seeking things. If you're, you know, you're greedy like me, I always am looking for a better space. And so it means that my, the way of listening, it seems to be more frenetic and less focused, at least in the compositional process. Okay, so, what's that? All right, that's a wayward slide. Uh, so some of the techniques and tools that I'm using in this brass project is, I've listed them all out there because it doesn't, I don't know why it's a built thing. Um, so I'm using, I'm acquiring training in 3D modeling of cultural heritage spaces uh, acquired training in photogrammetry and acoustic analysis using the Danish acoustic modeling software Odeon. Um, so I'll, I'll go over how I use these in the flow in a minute, but Unity, the game engine, I'm using that, and then the middleware Wise, and then that comes out to Ambisonics. And so the flow of this is that I go to use either previously created 3D models, either from the laser or from other people's photogrammetry projects. I can make my own using photogrammetry. And, um, and this is a tool that I use to build the acoustic models. And you compare them with things like GPS and compass data and scale bars, of which you then gather your dimensions of the space, which you can use to derive you know, acoustics and explore it in more depth. I um, obviously work on you collecting impulse responses of these places, and you use them in combination with your photogrammetric models or your previously acquired 3D models and your impulse responses, and you go in 
to Odeon, and you can use your impulse responses to build virtual impulse responses that then you can make more interesting acoustics. Um, and you can use them to train your derived acoustics. So because usually when you input things like your absorption coefficients, it's never perfect. And so you have to do a little bit of fiddling. And Odeon helps you fiddle. Um, and then after that, you can, you know, just print out oodles of impulse responses that you can then create into an interactive environment like Unity. Um, and then you can build convolution reverbs. Um, and you can also then go into WISE, which is middleware and has a very interesting, <coughs> at least for me, middle, like a plugin called Reflect, which you can build kind of interactive early reflections based on 3D models. And which will then include, rather than a lot of traditional box models where everything is just a box, you will also have corners, you will have vaults, you will have poles, there will be all sorts of things, and it kind of gives you a more interesting acoustic perspective. And then after that it all gets sent into ambisonics or highly directional sound. And these kind of immersive sound experiences I hope will really foster a sense of place and help people understand how they experience place and maybe help them <coughs> listen better and or listen maybe not better just listen in another way or maybe in a way that I want them to do this. so <clears throat> in my next section here and I'm just gonna hurry up was an example of a space which is that I've done and it's just an example. This is a kind of a demo. Um, it's a college, it's a temple with no roof on it, the College of the Agostales in Herculaneum. And I inf informed um, the impulses of the space through impulses that I'd taken. And, and I gave some relevant, you know, relevant sound samples that we can use briefly. And I also printed out the example of reflection, so you can see some of the, some of how the some of how the, um, the reflections are in the room, and so you can kind of use them to like explore, and I find that very compelling. But so in this one, this is sort of a so this is can you see that? too much time, but I just want to then, so the piece that I made for tonight is um, a creative implementation of these kind of like plugins. I made a, I took a space and I filled it to the brim with sound. Um, and I go around this space. And the structure of the, of, of the piece comes from me going around and finding places that I find interesting. Now there's a very real chance they wouldn't be necessarily what you would find interesting about the place. And that's why in future implementations there will be a, an open work, something where people can go and explore on their own 